Everybody, uh, welcome to this session on economic development and disparity in the north. Uh, my name is Tony Clark. I'm with the Alberta, thank you, Alberta Federation of Labor, uh, not the Polaris Institute. That's a uh, that's another uh, Tony Clark. Um, we're obviously a little bit behind due to the uh, plenary session, the very lively plenary session we just heard. Uh, so I'll just uh, get right into it. So, uh, I'll introduce uh, Trevor Harrison first. Uh, Trevor is a political sociologist at the University of Lethbridge and director of the Parkland Institute. His wide-ranging interests include, among other things, political movements, nationalism, militarism, political economy, and public policy. He's the author of several books and a frequent contributor to radio, television, and the print media. And Dr. Cora Voyager. Cora Voyager is a sociology professor at the University of Calgary. Her research interests include the Aboriginal experience in Canada, including leadership, employment, community and economic development, women's issues, and health. She's the author of Firekeepers of the 21st Century, Women Chiefs in Canada, and My Heroes Have Always Been Indians. She is co-author of Hidden, Hidden in Plain Sight, Contributions of Aboriginal People to Canadian Identity and Culture, Volumes 1 and 2. She's a member of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation from Northern Alberta. Dr. Cora Voyager, would you like to be in? Thank you. I think I'm on here. Can you hear me? Can you, no? Yes? Yes? People are, some people are saying yes and other people are saying no. Yes? Okay, now we're cooking, that's great. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today in, in my alma mater. I uh, came here way last century from uh, a little northern college and uh, I remember the first, when I was in, uh, in college, I had um, uh, a class that had 40 students in it and I thought, Oh my God, 40 students in a class? How are we supposed to learn? And I got to my first class that was in the Tory Lecture Theatre, and there was, I think, 600 students or 400 students. So anyway, I got to learn about um, how things change uh, awfully quickly. Um, I am a First Nations woman, as um, was mentioned. I'm a member of the Athabasca Chippewyan First Nation in northern Alberta. I was the first First Nations woman and the first, well, first First Nations person and the first Aboriginal woman to get uh, a PhD from this university. Thank you very much. I can tell you, you know, I have a life that I just can't even believe. I'm a residential school survivor, and I can tell you that I would have never believed in my entire life that I get to do the fantastic things that I do. And um, I try to uh, give an interesting and a unique perspective. I know that my background is very different than uh, many academics, and uh, with that, I'd like to speak with you a little bit today about um, resource expo um, uh, exploitation and Indigenous people, and I'm going to speak most specifically about the Treaty 8 region, which is Northern Alberta, and of course, this is where um, the Great Canadian Oil Sands are. And in fact, my chief, Alan Adam, is, uh, was supposed to be speaking in the next room. However, uh, Ariel Duranger, uh, one of my fellow band members, uh, is speaking there now. Here we go. Exploitation. Exploitation, as we know, has two connotations, one seemingly positive and the other uh, seemingly negative. And with this, um, with this presentation, I'm going to look at uh, some of the exploitation that has been going on in uh, my region. So the Treaty 8 region is in northern uh, Alberta, northern Saskatchewan goes up into the Northwest Territories and into Northeast and British Columbia. And for a very long time, the um, 
treaty region up in northern British Columbia was the only region that had been treated in all of British Columbia except for a little part on Vancouver Island, which was treated under the Douglas Treaties. You have to excuse me here. I have, uh, they tried to give me bifocals and it just didn't work. So anyway, I'm always changing glasses. So if you can just bear with me here. So anyway, as I mentioned, this was the only area in British Columbia that had been treated until recently. And as we know, the um, Treaty Commission is working as we speak in British Columbia to try to gain access through treaty to lands that had not been ceded. And we know that a treaty is an agreement between two entities. In our case, it was the First Nations people uh, in Canada and the Crown. Uh, in my region, Fort Chipoyan, Athabasca Chipoyan First Nation, uh, my great-grandfather, Alexandre Laviolette, signed treaty for us in 1899. Uh, from there, his younger brother um, took up the mantle after um, Alexandre had served for 30 years, and at that point, as hereditary chiefs, they, they uh, served until death. Um, Al uh, Jonas picked it up. He served for 30 years. Then uh, Fridolin Marcel, who was my granny's brother, uh, picked up the mantle for more than 30 years. So in essence, my family was in leadership in my community for more than 90 years. And in fact, we only had our first Indian Act elected chiefs in the mid-1980s. Uh, mid so in our region, my little town here, Fort Chipoyan, we have um, a mixture of Métis. Uh, about 10% of our population is non-Aboriginal, and we have two First Nations, the Athabasca Chipoyan First Nation, which is my nation, we're Dene. We are also in the same uh, line as the Apaches, the Navajo, the uh, Sutina, who are just outside of Calgary, uh, the Yellow Knives, and the Beaver Indians. We are all one, one uh, group, and the Cree, um, who are the uh, Miccosu Cree First Nation in, um, in Fort Chip. So we have been in our area for a very, very long time, as you can see. We have a, an archaeological uh, record that goes back 13,000 years, or about 500 generations. We have a very, if I can just organize myself here, please, I'm getting hot. It's that middle-aged women know what I'm talking about. Okay, am I on? Okay, great. Now we're ready to go again. <laughs> okay, so as I mentioned, uh, my little town, it's the oldest European settlement in Alberta. Uh, Fort Vermilion tries to say that it is, but really, we really know that it's us. So 1788, and we know that uh, we were established by the Northwest Company in 1788, and of course they came through the river system, so of course they'd have to get to us before they got over into um, northwestern uh, British Columbia, or Alberta, which is where Fort Vermilion is. So we are about, our community is about 130 years older than the province of Alberta. So, the land that we have is very precious to us. 
And this is our reserve. Fort Chipoyan, as I mentioned, uh, may have mentioned, is an isolated community. And we have to fly from Fort McMurray, about a one hour flight north of Fort McMurray. And in the winter, we are really happy for it to get cold because that means that we get to drive on the ice road. So when I was uh, speaking in England, people were coming up to me and saying, do you guys watch ice road truckers? And uh, I said, yes, and actually we get to drive on an ice road. Really? Well, they just couldn't believe that we got to drive on ice roads because it was so exciting. And uh, you know that we got to drive across the lake and drive up and down riverbanks and across rivers and that kind of thing. And our flight or our uh, uh, drive from Fort McMurray to uh, Fort Chip is about five hours. So it is a very, very long and very slow process uh, to get from one place to the other. So land, of course, has always been very important to uh, Canadians, and it's very dear to us as First Nations people. We know that land was used as a draw to bring people to the West. We know that there was worries that the uh, Americans were going to come up and annex uh, Canada uh, because it was a very sparsely populated, just, they had, just as they had annexed Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California from, uh, from Mexico. And uh, so Clifford Sifton, who was the Minister of the Interior, tried very desperately to populate the West. And he had gone through a number of campaigns in Europe to bring people over. And uh, the fact that people had an opportunity to, earn, to own land for the first time in their lives was what was the draw uh, for people to come to, um, to Canada. And we're, like, as I mentioned, we're also attached to the land. We see the, the land as being our mother in our uh, belief. We call Mother Earth, and as Mother Earth, we know that you do not own your mother. And um, so it's been very interesting to see what has been going on with the resource development over time, because it seems that at many times, we're viewed as being interlopers in our own, in our own land, which is a very uncomfortable, uh, position to be in, and we feel that it's our duty to um, to speak up on uh, to speak up for uh, the land. And uh, what we also know is that many times the uh, developers of these lands, you know, don't live anywhere near the land. So, you know, when you know all of the um, resources have been extracted, we're the ones that are left with with what is left over, and they get to fly back to wherever they are. So when we talk about resources, we talk about them as being renewable or non-renewable, and we also know that there are different types of resources as far as human resources and natural resources. This is what has been happening with the land in uh, the Fort McMurray, Fort McMurray region, um, which is, um, also part of our traditional territory. And it's very, it's very hard to see that um, you know, this type of thing is going on. But you know, that's, that's the way of the world. Resources in our area have been known about for hundreds of years. In fact, the first um, mention of oil sands was in Samuel Hearn's uh, diary in the 1700s when they talked about this oily pitch that was brought to the um, to Samuel Hearn by a man by the name of Swan, a Cree Indian, and he told them that they used this uh, material to uh, waterproof their canoes. And he said that when they came down the Athabasca River uh, with their Indian guides, that they saw oil seeping out of the banks. And of course, this was the oil sands. So as you can see uh, the, this, from this map here, we have um, a very large uh, amount of our land, or almost all of our land, that is currently uh, 
under development by a variety of companies. In fact, we have 42 companies on our traditional land. And if you were to see a more detailed map than this, you would see that it almost looks like uh, a patchwork quilt. And things have changed over uh, the years. As First Nations people, we have won a number of um, Supreme Court of Canada, I just touched something, uh, Supreme Court of Canada uh, cases. Uh, in which consultation was an issue. In these cases, the Mikasu case, for example, which was brought by uh, the other band in our community, and uh, the Haida and the Taku River uh, cases from British Columbia. These dealt with issues around consultation because as First Nations people, we are essentially wards of the government. And the government in this trust-like relationship is, has what is called a fiduciary duty to us, and they must uh, do what is right for us, just as you would in a trust-like relationship with a trustee. And um, so with that, we were unhappy and concerned that the government was not, um, was not taking care of our interests as well as we thought they should. And um, so we brought cases, and of course, these are cases that we have to finance ourselves, and it takes anywhere from seven to 11 years to get cases to the Supreme Court, and of course, we know that you're not guaranteed of winning. However, what we have done over the years is we have been able to use uh, the Canadian law. We have a number of very skilled um, uh, First Nations lawyers. In fact, we now have a First Nations man who is uh, the first uh, person to sit on the federal, the federal Court of Appeal. And um, so we're you know, making our way through the professions and representing ourselves. So uh, with that, uh, this um, slide shows how, how many and how much of our land is being ta taken up in resources. We've seen a great number of individuals. We have First Nations and individually owned businesses. We have uh, David Tuckerow up here. David Tuckerow and I uh, aren't actually related. However, in, as we know in many small communities, people are related through a number of different ways. Um, we're not actually related. However, my cousin is married to his brother. My niece is married to his nephew. And my aunt is married to his uncle. So. <laughs> We live in a very small town. <laughs> so David um, actually just sold his group of companies, and he has been called by some the richest Indian in Canada. He sold uh, an 80% share of his company, or 75% share of his company for $102 million, and he still has his real estate holdings of over $25 million. And actually, he is the subject of, pardon me, Peter Newman's next book, which is going to be out within the next couple of weeks. So he is um, planning his, um, his uh, speaking tour. Doug Golosky is a Métis man from Fort McMurray, and he started out as a welder and ended up sending, selling his business uh, for X millions of dollars uh, a couple of years ago and is now retiring and very happily golfing uh, where it's warm. Um, these ladies, as you see here, are um, women from a group called uh, North Eastern Al or Northern Alberta Aboriginal Business Association. These are all individual um, entrepreneurs. And NABA is a group that was formed by a number of Indigenous um, uh, business owners. And between the 125 of them, they do about $2 billion worth of business each year. So we are business people. We have always been business people. And it's, it's very interesting because, um, you know, when we tell people this, um, you know, people don't really know who we are as a people. You know, we know that we have, you know, some severe social issues in our, pro in our community. However, uh, you know, I, I think it's quite unfair to, um, you know, judge an entire group of people by its most vulnerable members. And we are working very hard to deal with the ravages of residential schools. Uh, at one point, all of, almost all of the children, our children in, in uh, our community were in residential schools. 
and we were legislated by the government. And if you didn't send your children to le residential school, you could be prison, imprisoned for two years. So, the media. Um, in the media, we are viewed as barriers. We're seen out there protesting and, um, you know, opposing uh, industry, impo uh, opposing development, and that's not necessarily the way uh, it is. What we want is we want there to be a plan. We want there to be um, benefits to the community. So, you know, we don't think we're being uh, unreasonable. Um, in my little community of Fort Chip, you cannot swing a cat without hitting either a filmmaker, a researcher, or a consultant. And it is really, um, you know, I, and I, I'm part of that group. I um, was invited by my chief and council uh, two and a half years ago to head a research study that I've been working on for the past, well, two and a half years, two years, and um, helping them deal with some of the issues that they're dealing with as a result of resource development. However, with this, I kind of placate myself by saying that I was invited into the community. I have not cost the community any money because my university picks up the costs of my salary and that I have also brought in X number of research grants that brings jobs into the community as well as resources. So um, just um, to um, quote a lady in our community that I interviewed and she said, sure our story is being told, it doesn't feel very good to have everybody telling you what's wrong with your town and then showing it to the whole world. She said that, you know, every, every filmmaker portrays them as being victims and that there are people with no agency, which is not true. So, um, you know, I think we have to be very careful about what we do. So we, as I mentioned, First Nations people have adapted very, uh, have adapted to a new economy. It was really interesting when I was putting this slide together because I was trying to find photographs of Indians working. I know they work. I, you know, had heard stories of my grandfather who worked as a tracker for the Hudson's Bay Company. I could not find any pictures, any historic pictures of Indians working. I'm assuming that these guys over here at the sawmill, uh, we can't really see their faces, but I'm assuming that some of them are Indians because this was done on an Indian reserve. Um, we have the uh, woman with the dried fish. We have people uh, in the boats, as well as this was uh, a farming. Uh, the top photo is a farming um, a photo from southern Alberta. However, we have a number of contemporary adaptations of um, employment we, on the bottom right. We have Dr. Malcolm King uh, on top we have uh, Adam Beach and Tina Keeper. We also have a number of technical people who are being trained as well as scientific people. We have really bought into meritocracy. In fact, a larger proportion of our adult population is now in post-secondary institutions. In fact, five percentage points higher than mainstream. We have taken to education like ducks take to water. And this has not come easy to us because of the, res of the residential schools. And in fact, in our legislation, in the Indian Act, if you got a university degree, you could lose your Indian status. So our, our path to education has not been easy. However, in the past 50 years, we have attained Educational, educational credentials at a rate that is just absolutely astronomical in 50 years. I tell people 28% of our population now has some form of post-secondary education compared to 42% in mainstream. So for us to do that in 50 years is just, it is very good and shows how, um, 
determined we are to become part of the economy, the knowledge economy and the service economy. We are more diverse in our studies than we used to be in the past. As I, you can see here that most are first generation university attendees as I am. However, uh, we're starting to see second and third univer uh, generation university goers. Um, at one point, we were primarily in social work and education. However, now we have moved into the professions, uh, into the hard sciences. And um, we know that women have, indigenous women have uh, more degrees than men uh, at a, a rate of about three to one. So in our communities, women run our communities. However, the men are the politicians. <laughs> Okay, I'll just let you um, take a quick look at this while I get the hook, uh, letting you know that uh, there are sy systemic uh, barriers, there's differential treatments, there's unions are sometimes the issue, um, and I've spoken uh, not too much at length with this with Gil McGowan, however, there are still issues of racism. I speak to industry, I speak to government, and I say to them, racism is costing you money. I don't know what your ideas are of who we are as First Nations people, but I bet you they're not that accurate. So we are a nation on the move. 50%, if I can just go to the very last slide. Take a look at this. This is our demographic. 50% of our population is under the age of 25. Our population has tripled in the last 30 years. So we are going to be the workers of the future. So, you know, we have to uh, understand that we are credentialed people, we are hard workers, and we are people who are willing to work. So with that, I'm going to leave that and let um, Trevor go ahead. And thank you so much for hearing me. Thank you, Coram. Uh, Trevor? Well, while, uh, while things are being uh, loaded up there, it's, uh, it is actually really wonderful to be here uh, today. And, and uh, yeah, what can I say? I, I, it, this has been a fabulous conference so far, and uh, I, I think it's going to prove to be uh, great the rest of the way. I'm also especially happy, I have to say, to be on this uh, particular panel with Cora. Uh, Cora and I share being both graduates uh, from the University of Alberta. We both got our uh, doctorates here in sociology. Uh, but also, in, in looking at the, uh, the uh, photos and, uh, and the, the talk here, I spent a good deal of time actually in uh, Fort McMurray in the 1980s, and in fact, my daughter was born up there. Uh, we moved from there when she was two years old, but uh, uh, one of the, uh, my uh, fondest memories, in fact, is not just of Fort McMurray, but I had the great occasion of going up to uh, Fort Chippewa on a number of occasions and, and always really enjoyed it. It was just uh, great going up there. When I was uh, looking at the program itself, in fact, uh, and the talk I'm going to give is kind of a big, broad, spatial, conceptual, historical kind of talk here. And I thought I really should have gone first here because, you know, you start broad and then Cora would kind of center in, in uh, more narrowly. And, and after listening to, uh, to Cora, I think that's actually even more the case that, uh, that perhaps I should have gone first. And the reason for this is uh, that, that Cora has finished off with what I think is a really necessary corrective in terms of being actually a fairly positive uh, depiction, so very hopeful. And mine is probably going to be a little bit more bleak. Uh, but because it's talking about kind of horrible things like exploitation and colonization. But I think it is really necessary to correct it, to realize that there are some good things going on, and so we need to keep kind of that kind of balance going there. So, um, where's my little flipper here? Ah, here it is. Okay. So, uh, this, uh, this talk is, a, it, it's also one of those wonderful things when you have conferences like this, is sometimes serendipitously things kind of come together. Without too much of an overlap, uh, in fact, some of the things I'm going to talk about are going to be kind of echoing some of the things we've heard last night from Ronald Wright and from others. 
Uh, as any number of authors have uh, talked about, uh, uh, fiction, nonfiction writers and others, uh, from Farley Mowat to Pierre Burton, uh, the North is really important to Canada, to Canadians. It's a really important part of our uh, sense of identity. Uh, so much of uh, our kind of mythology about Canada goes back to, uh, as was mentioned in fact last night about Frankenstein, who of course is set adrift on an ice flow in the north. Uh, couldn't write that too much longer, won't be any ice flows, but you know, what can you do about that? Uh, Sir John Franklin, all these kind of stories. So the north is really kind of important to us on a whole series of levels, uh, but increasingly it's become uh, separated in terms of being viewed as really important in economic terms. So there's some people, for example, such as this gentleman here, who uh, really talks about you know, the development of the North for its particular resources. So the future of this country should look North, the great national dream, the development of Northern resources, no longer sleeps, it is down the road, is happening now. Of course, this builds to some extent on the old progressive conservative ideas of John Diefenbaker, who wanted to open up the North. Uh, but you know, it's, it's a different kind of flavor now. This is like solely economic development. Well. My uh, talk today is actually going to be uh, centered on four uh, fundamental arguments here. Uh, the first one is that the term the North is imprecise when restricted to only the territories. Uh, Northern development means in most cases not only resource extraction in the territories but also the top half of the provinces. Second, Northern development has occurred where Aboriginal people make up a significant portion of the North's population and cannot be separated from a past history of exploitation and colonization. Third, the benefits of Northern development overwhelmingly go to people in the southern part of Canada and beyond. The North has been in the past and continues to be treated as a resource colony too often for the South, taking the risks and getting few long-term benefits. And fourth, development in the North has often been meant, or has at least had the effect of, dealing with problems occurring in the South or in capitalist markets outside of Canada altogether. All so, to my first argument here. So what is the North? Uh, one of the things I've actually been uh, doing over the last few years, I find my work getting into kind of uh, analyzing the way we use words and the way we understand abstraction. So we say the North as though it kind of means something, but you know, when you think about used to ask students, uh, you know, what do you mean by the West? What do you mean by the prairies? Where, how far does the prairies go? Is BC part of the West? Where is the North? What is the East? My wife, who's from Newfoundland, every time uh, she'd hear somebody in Alberta saying, oh, those damn Easterners, and she'd say, no, 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 the East is Newfoundland. You have nothing against us. You're talking about Central Canada, right? So we have all these kind of conceptual models of space that, you know, sometimes we use words, but, but it's actually fairly inexact. So much of the current discussion around pipelines and tar sands development has ignored the regional specificity of these events. The fact that resource development occurs primarily in the north. Unfortunately, use of the term north is used imprecisely with the result of obscuring where development occurs, who is involved, the relations of power as it were, and who development is done to. And there's a lot of being done to in the history of the north. The North is as vast and imprecise as our imaginations about it. Its borders shift over time depending on the resources being exploited. But for the last 50 years, the term North has often meant areas in the northern half of the provinces that have been opened up for economic development. So you see here, this is a, uh, a model, this is kind of one model of what the North looks like, and what we're going to concentrate on is really kind of the, not just the Arctic, which a lot of people would say is the North, but the subarctic, which is re really where a lot of that, the development has happened. So what happened here? Well, back in the mid-1960s, and more particularly into the early 1970s, Province after province across Canada, the governments began to engage in something that was called province building. Um, and you know, almost in a way, kind of like Harold Innes actually pointed out, that each region has its kind of specific resource, its specific staple that gets exploited. So you have hydropower in Quebec, hydropower in Manitoba, BC. You have uh, mining in uh, Saskatchewan, uh, mining also in northern Ontario. Uh, and in Alberta, of course, 
you have oil, petroleum development. But all of this is occurring in the northern half of the province. It's, it's the south moving into the north, and in a rapid period of time to bring these areas, these peoples, everyone who's living there, the economy, into the economy of the south. Argument two, the primacy of Aboriginal peoples where northern development occurs. I put up this slide, I could go back to the last one. You know, this is kind of similarity. These are, the, these are the primary tribes that exist within these areas, and this is where a lot of the development is actually occurred, occurring. Canada's Aboriginal identity population, is a, who self-identify as Aboriginal peoples, today is nearly 1.2 million people. This includes First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. As a summary figure, it is often stated, you can look this up at StatsCan, that Canada's Aboriginal population makes up 3.8% of the total population and growing. And uh, the next slide here has the, oops, amazing how things shift when you suddenly stick it on a key in here. Anyway, you see here's the total populations of Aboriginal identif uh, identity populations for these regions and for Canada as a whole. Uh, but these figures don't capture the reality of northern development and its impacts upon Aboriginal peoples. And I use that in the plural. For much of development occurs in regions where Aboriginal peoples still make up a large portion of the population. Areas that are traditional homelands, areas where ways of life and commitments to the land and community remain strong. So, here what we have is, uh, I've tried to, to uh, actually figure out roughly what the uh, actual populations might be in these areas, and I, I will tell you these are rough figures, so these are very rough calculations, but I kind of separated large cities, added a few others for the areas in the southern parts of the, uh, of the uh, provinces and Canada. So again, what we have is a total population of almost 1.2 million Aboriginal peoples. Uh, again, 3.8% of the overall Canadian population, but keep in mind here that about 90% of the Canadian population, the total population, exists within 500 uh, kilometers of the U.S. border, so roughly up to somewhere around Calgary and beyond. Um, roughly 66% of Aboriginal peoples probably live in these other areas. So you figure this out and all of a sudden you have uh, roughly maybe 24% of the north, that north area including the subarctic, actually being Aboriginal people. And this is where a lot of the development is occurring. Now, of course there are a large number of uh, non-Aboriginal people in the northern regions. And over time many have come to view the north as their home. Uh, I was born in Edmonton. Edmonton would classify as being kind of the, the bottom end of that start of that northern subarctic area. Uh, and very proudly so. In fact, when I moved to uh, Lethbridge, uh, one of the very first things I had to do, even though I was told it was impossible, I, I had to plant spruce trees because I absolutely love spruce trees and I grew up in the north and everything has to, I love spruce. So, you know, they don't grow them down in the south. They say they die off, but I grew them. Um, as I said, I lived in Fort McMurray for a time, and I've traveled around various parts of northern Alberta and into the Northwest Territories, and my daughter was, was born in Fort McMurray, so I'm very proud of that. But the reality is that uh, despite the fact that many of us, uh, many people have raised families and put down roots in the north, in many ways these are still very much Aboriginal territories. And the history of the north is also one of small towns and sometimes very large cities being built to exploit local resources with all the attendant ills that follow, only to be abandoned later. I'll give you a couple of examples here. And I happened to be actually in Fort McMurray when uh, Uranium City was being shut down. In fact, I was on a plane that day and there was a banker from the TD Bank and he was flying out that day to fly down to Edmonton to find out how they were gonna process the shutting down of the bank because overnight everything was going. Uranium City had a population of 5,000 people. And then 1983, it shut down. Today, the population stands at 89 people. And most of those people are Aboriginal peoples who are still suffering the consequences of uranium development. 
give you another example. Shefferville, Quebec. Some of you may well remember this. This was the Iron Ore Company of Canada. When it was shut down just about the same time as Uranium City by uh, Brian Mulroney, it also had about 5,000 people. Today it has 213 people. And of those 213 people, most of them, again, are still Aboriginal peoples. Ghost towns, former resource towns. These are at the center of much of Canada's economic history and development. Towns, cities, and provinces that experienced boom and bust. And when the development re-ceased, the indigenous peoples of the area were too often left with the consequences. Argument three. Northern development often benefits the south. Oh, just very quickly here. So here's a few other towns and cities, and you see again the proportion of population in these towns and cities that is over that established 3.8% of the Canadian population being Aboriginal. Once you start to move north, you see that the towns and cities, Aborig Aboriginal peoples make up a large portion of the population. So, uh, and it's interesting yesterday, as I said, it's kind of serendipitous, uh, uh, Ronald Wright talked about the gold rush. Um, the gold rush in some ways is kind of archetypical of the way development has happened in the North. Different resource, but same kind of storyline, same kind of narrative. In 1896, gold was discovered along the Klondike River by an American, George Carmack, his Tagish wife, Kate Carmack, her brother, Skokum Jim, and their nephew, Dawson Charlie. Word of the find quickly spread, and within weeks, the Yukon was flooded with young men, mainly men, seeking their fortunes, tales of which were later recorded by Jack London and, of course, Pierre Burton, who grew up in Dawson City. In 1896, Dawson City had a population of 1,000 people. Two years later, it had a population of 30,000. And by 1912, it had dropped back down again to 2,000. While some Aboriginal people benefited from the gold rush in the short term, the long-term consequences were disastrous, involving environmental damage, sounds familiar today, destruction of hunting grounds, disease, famine, and a series of other problems. The pattern of unequal and uncertain development that marked the gold rush has continued over ever since. One measure is incomes for Aboriginal peoples in the northern regions. I'll just very quickly run through these. So these are comparisons of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal incomes as, as a percentage. So it's the raw figure for the, uh, the income and then the percentage of uh, non-Aboriginal. So, why does uh, development uh, not benefit the North more? Uh, well, there's a number of reasons. Lack of political control, and this is obvious for the territories. They're territories, they're not provinces, so they don't have control of their resources. When I was in uh, the Yellowknife a few years ago, this was an ongoing debate about how to get more control over local development. Uh, economic development often proceeds uh, before social and infrastructure development. This is, again, long-standing history, so economic development rushes in first. Everything else lags behind, and there's a lot of people are left behind. Um, many of the costs are not built into the economic model, as we've heard about repeatedly at this conference, about the uh, externalization of real costs. So, for example, just the roads going up to Fort McMurray. Who pays for those things? You know, well, by and large, it's, it's certainly not the oil companies if you factored in the real costs of this. Uh, foreign investment also uh, tends to lend itself to the leakage of wealth. So what we've seen is huge amounts of wealth being present, uh, created in northern Alberta and Alberta as a whole, but a lot of leakage outside. So we come to petroleum. Why should we imagine that petroleum will be any different than any other resource developed in the North in the past. In the case of tar sands, it is proposed the bitumen will be hauled out and shipped through the Northern Gateway Pipeline to the West Coast or the Keystone Pipeline to the Gulf Coast. Jo to the Gulf Coast. Jobs will be shipped out along this 
along with this raw bitumen, something we heard about in the last session, while the pipelines cross in many instances Aboriginal territory, especially in the case of Northern Gateway. The risks of development once again fall on the people living in the north, while many of the benefits occur elsewhere. Now there are, of course, incomes and jobs that are created outside of the north. Um, but by and large, Canadians as a whole don't get the full benefits of this. And the people of the North quite often don't get the benefits of this while again suffering the risks. And one of the things that I was talking when I was talking with Ronald Wright yesterday was it came up the idea that, you know, in terms of progress, which he was talking about, every time we think we gain something, the, the real question we should also be asking ourselves is what is it that we lose? What is it we've lost? And we don't ask that question enough. And sometimes, as Joni Mitchell said, you don't know what you lost till it's gone, all right? In terms of a whole set of human relationships and values that become eclipsed by this notion of development. Finally, my fourth argument. Um, oh, and here's a map just showing of where the keystone is. So, my fourth argument was that northern colonization uh, is sometimes, it's quite often associated with dealing with southern problems. Development of the type that has gone on in the north has typically been of the colonial type within the country benefiting those in the metropolis, over the hinterland, outside the country, the core countries, the center of the empire at the expense of the periphery, and colonized regions. Often development has been an attempt to solve problems within the core while exporting problems to the periphery. If I can go back to the gold rush for a moment, uh, one of the things that not a lot of people are actually aware of, but in fact, the gold rush came at a point when the world was suffering what at that point was called the first Great Depression. And the effect of the gold rush was it actually produced, provided a huge amount of liquidity to capital markets that were in need of it. And so the gold rush had a larger effect than just even on Dawson City or the Yukon. It actually helped pull the world economy out of an economic problem. Ronald Wright, in one of his uh, books, actually, Stolen Continents, has another example. All that money that was the gold that was stolen from the Incas, that money, that gold, was used then to, for, to actually uh, create the Industrial Revolution. It became the source of liquid capital fueling later development in Europe. The gold went back to Europe and the Industrial Revolution began thereafter. There are other examples of how uh, colonization has in various ways solved certain kinds of problems, sometimes in various, not necessarily directly economic reasons overpopulations. So you ship people off to Australia or various other colonies because you don't know what to do with feisty young men. But colonization has the effect of actually solving problems that are, are occurring at the heart of empire. So today, petroleum development in Canada's north is viewed by many politicians in Edmonton and Calgary and Ottawa and Washington and elsewhere as solutions to peak oil. But the real solution lies with politicians and populations in the South to look locally, to use resources more wisely, and to develop, to develop new technologies, rather than exploiting, exploiting and exporting the problems of the South into these other regions. So finally, we need to rethink our ideas of development. What we need to do is ask ourselves some very tough questions. And I'll finish off with these. So what is development? Who wants it? Who benefits from resource development in particular? And who pays the cost when it is over? Is it possible to reconcile economic development with society, social development and intergenerational fairness, with environmental concern, with democracy? And finally, and most importantly, what kind of society do we want? Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Trevor. Uh, now it's time for the uh, question and answer, answer session. Um, we'll do it uh, as we've been typically doing during this uh, conference in uh, bunches of three, give or take. Um, we have a couple of uh, runners with microphones. If you'd like to uh, pose a question to uh, Cora or Trevor, just please raise your hand. There we go. Um, thank you to both of you. Um, that was um, stimulating. Uh, Cora, I have a question for you, and maybe um, Trevor, you'd also want to respond. Um, it's easy for us white folks to um, to romanticize, right, Aboriginal connections to the land. So I don't I don't want to fall into that. But I am interested in you starting with the importance of land and then going into the educational and economic attainments right in Fort Chiboyan. So how, in your experience there, it, both living there and then going back as a researcher, how would you describe how people are dealing with thinking about responding to negotiating the tension between that importance of land next to the fact that it is the exploitation of the land that is allowing for right, economic and educational attainment. So we'll just um, go in chunks of uh, three questions at a time, and then, and then the panel can answer if you Okay, want. already. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Uh, hi. So I recently had the experience of taking a tour through, through the oil sands as well as ending up in Port McMurray to do a little bit of, of an exploration of their infrastructure. And I found myself quite um, disturbed, especially with the infrastructure in Port McMurray. Uh, it seems that there's been a giant um, increase in population, and with that, a very bad lack of planning. And one of the places we were taken to was that main brand new rec center, which was a beautiful rec center, but it's in the middle of an island, and all the houses seem to sprawl out beyond that. And it doesn't seem very feasible for a young person or a senior to, to be able to get there without a transportation. It becomes very difficult. Mm -hmm. And so my question then goes to the idea of infrastructure and disparity for the future. And how exactly can we move as a society to create better infrastructure and to move away from, from this happening again? And what sort of things can we do as communities to push for better planning for the future? Thank you. And one in the back, please. Hello. Um, hi. Thank you very much for the two very stimulating talks. My question really is for you, Cora. Um, we hear a lot from the Indigenous Environmental mu Movement, from Greenpeace, from other organizations, about the complicity of certain elements with indigenous, within Indigenous communities with the uh, international oil companies and their contractors in despoiling the um, mother nature, if you will, and trampling on the rights of mother nature and therefore marginalizing large sections of both the indigenous and the settler descendant communities who are dependent on hunting, trapping, certain kinds of farming and the like. I wonder how you and uh, your colleagues, the entrepreneurs, women and men, uh, respond to this kind of uh, discussion. Yeah, Cora, would you like to begin? I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the first question asked about the conflict between those who develop the land. So I think there's uh, maybe a combining of question one and question three because they seem to have the same theme. Um, it's not an easy thing. I mean, it's, um, there is conflict, there's a tension there. Uh, people need to put um, food on the table. And in our little community, our uh, economy, um, as I mentioned, Fort Chipoyan was established in 1788. However, a lot of the people lived in little communities out around Fort Chipoyan, Big Point, Old Fort, uh, Dog Camp, Fish Camp, uh, all of these different places. And it was the late 50s and early 60s where all of these people were rounded up and brought into Fort Chip for the benefit, so essentially a relocation, for the benefit of the government so services could be given 
to the people. So, um, so there is, you know, that issue and, and actually being away from the land. But um, again, um, the economy of Fort Chipoyan, as far as the, the trapping and, and um, whatnot goes, that started to go down in the late 1960s with the building of the Bennett Dam, where the water levels uh, went down, I believe it was nine feet uh, in the river and in the lake. Actually, I was out on a boat this uh, summer going out to a, a place called Little Rapids, and you could see on the rocks where the, where the water level had gone down that much. It was, it was absolutely astounding. Uh, and that was a result of the uh, of the dam. So the degradation of the environment in that area has been going on for decades. So again, what do you do? Do you um, do you say no? I'm not going to do it. And you know, then what do you do? You've got to work. You've got to work. You've got to support your family. And it's really interesting too, because what you see in the community is there are some people, I mean, you drive down the streets and you can clearly see which people work in resource, the industry, and who don't. Because we've got, you know, the boats, we've got the quads, uh, snowmobiles, uh, you know, these, I mean, my brother's pickup was $72,000. Like, I just shake my head. You know, but this is, this, you know, it is what it is. People are saying, look, you know, this is going ahead anyway. Do we get, try to get our little piece of it? Do we try to uh, support ourselves and, and whatnot? Or do we say, no, we're, we're not going to be a part of it? And it's an individual thing. I mean, people have, I mean, I think uh, sometimes there's an idea that, you know, we as First Nations people, you know, think with this group mind. I mean, we're individuals. And you know, just as mainstream society has more than one political party, I mean, we, you know, we're entitled to to think differently about things, and everybody is entitled to their opinion. And of course, people have different views on whether they want to be involved in it. It's going to happen anyway. Are we going to let all the white people come in here and take all the resources and all the money away, or do we set up our own companies, and you know, compete with those with those companies as? Uh, NABA did. I mean, the fact that NABA was uh, organized to begin with was a result of exactly that. Uh, outside companies uh, were coming into the coming into the region and snapping up all the all the contracts, and the indigenous people were not, um, you know, were either not not didn't know about it or you know didn't have the um, the uh, capacity at that point to compete for those uh, contracts, so they got together and pooled their resources, and now they're bringing in two billion dollars a year. So again, it's it's a tough one, and there is no easy answer. I wish there were, but there isn't. So. If I sound like I'm talking about both sides of my mouth, I probably am. But you know what? That's the nature of the world. I'll uh, maybe attempt an answer to the question about the infrastructure. I know uh, when I first moved up to Fort McMurray in 1980, it was uh, things had slowed down a bit. It was starting to catch up, but there were still some really serious lacks there. And, and then actually, in some ways, one of the better things happened was, of course, the, there was a collapse in the oil prices, which gave it kind of a breathing time. But then things went nuts again. And when the price of oil went up, then everything starts to boom. The problem is that you, what you need is actually a government that will actually act as a kind of buffer for citizens and for the community good against what obviously corporations want to develop as things as fast as they can, right? I mean, they, they, that's how they survive. Uh, if you don't have a kind of buffer on that, if you don't try to, to set some kind of proper pace for development, if you don't plan, and remember, of course, for a long time we had a government in this province that was anti-planning. It was somehow a bad thing to plan. And, and so what you have is the situation that occurred in Fort McMurray. This is not a terribly new thing because we've seen it again in resource towns right across Canada forever. Um, but in the case of Fort McMurray, it is such a huge project that the problems become really immense. I mean, just for example, um, the, the cost of housing. 
the fact that there is no housing. So what do you do? Well, your choice is either you buy a, a, uh, an old uh, small trailer, relatively small trailer for $450,000, or you buy a house that's maybe $700,000, or you rent some corner of a basement for $1,200 a month, and, and there's, I mean, it's basically one room. What, what's your choice there? You want to work there, the money looks pretty good, but there's really huge investments there. So housing is just one issue. And again, if you had a government that's properly planning health, education for all those young families that move in there, um, transportation, um, then maybe you have a proper pacing for it and you deal with some of these problems. But that isn't the history of what we've done there. So. Thank you. Three more questions, please. There's a couple of mics in the back. Thank you. What's the status? What's the status of residential schools now? Number one, and number two. When you say X percent of people have post-secondary education, I'm not sure. Where, where did they have their high school education? Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Would you mind repeating that just a little louder for us? One is the status. What is the present status of residential schools? And number two. Those who have post-secondary education among native people, where do they get their high school education? Number three, did residential school curriculum help people to proceed with their post-secondary education? How functional was it? Just these three questions. Thank you. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I'll just repeat those as, as, uh, as we heard them here. The, uh, what is the status of residential schools presently? Uh, what is the status of, of high school education? And, uh, and did residential schools help with uh, post-secondary education? Yeah. Or whether, whether they had to go to some other high school uh, okay. and not residential. Just wanted to. Thank you. Um, yeah, this question is for Cora. You touched on it in your presentation about uh, racism being a part of this conversation. And I was wondering if you could just expand a little bit and comment a little bit more about that. You mentioned there were various facets, uh, including unions and whatnot. And I was just curious um, about that. Thanks. Uh, this question is also for Cora. You joke that the women in the community are the better educated ones and the that's no joke okay sorry <laughs> i'm not getting to the joke part you mentioned that the women are the better educated in the community and that the men are the politicians how does that factor play into the community decision making and negotiations with organizations uh, involved in decisions and resource management thank you um I would uh, guess that um, the majority of those answers might be better served with Cora uh, speaking first. So Cora, would you mind? All right. Um, residential schools are all now closed in Canada. The last one closed in 1996. That was in Liberet, Saskatchewan. And uh, as far as education goes, um, the basic education that people got in residential schools, there's essentially, essentially four parts, reading, writing, arithmetic, and religion. And so with emphasis on the religion part. So the education that people got was not that great. And in fact, much of the types of education that people got uh, Boys, if we were to look at something like an industrial school where uh, women or, or girls were taught how to keep a house, how to take care of children, that kind of thing, because a lot of these uh, people were farmed out to, uh, to work as domestic workers for, uh, for white families in the area, so to help farm women take care of their you know, umpteen dozen kids that you know, we seemed to have back then. Um, so that was what girls did, and, in, and the fellows were uh, most likely to be schooled in, uh, in animal husbandry, so they could go out and help the farmers and the ranchers and whatnot take care of, take care of the animals. So that was more of the emphasis of uh, education, and in fact, the uh, residential school education only went up to grade eight. So the types of schooling and, and training that people got wasn't necessarily um, what people would need to get into post-secondary. Uh, 
So, um, and what we also saw was that there was almost a streaming of, of Indigenous people into vocational training rather than university, um, uh, university preparation. And it was really interesting because I was speaking with, um, uh, and this has been happening until quite recently, uh, I was talking to a, a girlfriend and she was telling me that she had to fight with her school uh, guidance counselor uh, to take uh, courses that would help her to get into university because the guidance counselor had the idea that, you know, all we have to do is make sure that they have, you know, English 10 and, and you know, science 20 and that kind of thing rather than, rather than the, uh, the type of training or the type of uh, courses to get them into university. So what's been happening um, in the Indigenous community is that um, a lot of... Uh, adults go back to school and get academic upgrading. So that's how many of the people get in. But what we're also starting to see is we're starting to see more people going to school straight from grade 12, or pardon me, from K to 12, and going straight into post-secondary. So we're starting to see that trend, which makes us very happy. And also the fact that we um, are starting to see more people go straight into faculties rather than you know, take this um, little side road in, you know, through uh, companies and uh, post-secondary institutions which offer academic upgrading specifically for Indigenous people. So uh, in my perfect world, there would be no need for those types of services in the future. So that's, that's what's happening. Um, and lastly, uh, I think I answered all those questions. Is that right? I think I, an I answered the first three. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the um, uh, the, the question uh, regarding um, racism. Uh, many of the people that I interviewed uh, in my research on Aboriginal employment told very, very uh, stark stories of uh, racism in the uh, in the uh, workplace. I know for myself as an Indigenous scholar uh, in the university system, I've suffered racism. You know, with the idea that you know our credentials are undervalued, you're de you're deemed to be quote an equity hire. You know, you're only here because uh, of the Employment Equity Act. Otherwise, you wouldn't be hired. Uh, also, um, you know, people feel that they essentially work in a in a fishbowl where people are watching them. There's a lack of trust in the. Um, in the uh, training and the uh, qualifications of Indigenous people. And uh, this was most specific, and what they also said was that um, they didn't feel that their uh, training uh, and their skills were being used, and that was more specifically women than men. So those are some of the types of things that uh, that happen. There's also, uh, you know, this um, saying. I mean, those of us that are indigenous kind of laugh about it and and whatnot. You know, Indians are, you know, fill in the blank afterwards. And also this idea that you know you're different than those Indians. Um, you know, you're 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 like us. I mean, you're kind of like us. You know, so if you're like us, how can you be like them? So, you know, that type of comparison that goes on. So anyway, there's, there's quite a lot of racism. And again, dealing with the issue of trust and the fact that uh, Indigenous workers are primarily uh, brought in at uh, lower rungs on the, um, um, on the um, employment scale. So, you know, those are some of the things that people told me about in their, um, in their experiences of racism in the... Um, you know, and there's also, if I can be so bold as to talk about uh, racism and uh, the sexualization of Indigenous women, and that is a real, that is a real issue. I know for me as a graduate student, I, can't, I couldn't keep these guys' hands off me, because as Indigenous women, you know, we're, we're up for it anywhere, anytime. And um, it was tough. Trevor, would you like to say a few words? No, okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm afraid we have to wrap things up in order for the... Uh, one, quick one quick question, please. Would each of you respond, what is likely to go to the Keystone Pipeline becoming a reality? I, if I was going to bet, I don't think it's going to happen. 
Or the Keystone or the Gateway? Gateway. A gateway. That's no, the gate. I don't think Gateway is going to go ahead. I don't think it's possible politically for a lot of reasons. Yeah, Keystone I'm not sure. Go ahead. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you, panelists, Cora, Trevor. Very interesting discussion.